A very good evening to all of you here. Thank you, first of all, to the BW team for having all of us here. And I'm sure I say that for all, uh, all of us on this panel. Um, I'm Neha Nakpal, uh, and I would be moderating this panel on this rather interesting topic, an introspection to seven years of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. It has really been a game changer in terms of the economic landscape in this country. But it's also time to deep dive in, you know, it's been seven years, it's been enough of a time period to see how things have panned out. Um, and I mean, I must add that the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code was a stellar piece of legislation which was actually brought in to sort of promote the ease of doing business. But we're sort of stuck in a situation where out of 6,199 cases which were admitted to insolvency in, as of end December 2022, only 10% have ended in a successful resolution plan. Uh, approximately uh, 1,900 cases have landed in liquidation. And there are a large number of them that are still pending today for uh, before the NCLT. On that note, I will start with Mr. Arvind Nair, who's a very regular practitioner at NCLT and NCLAT. So one has seen the load on the NCLTs and NCLAT, you know, just muscle mount. Uh, and, and I'm specifically just talking about IBC cases. I mean, of course, the NCLT holds various jurisdictions, but I'm talking about only the insolvency cases. To a point that Supreme Court in the SR Steel Resolution Plan judgment in November of 2019 even directed the government to set up a Chennai bench of the NCLAT. Um, you know, in, in your experience, are the NC, NCLTs and, and consequently NCLAT still flooded? And is the mandate of Section 12 of the Insolvency Code, which in, you know, pretty much says that on the outer limit, the insolvency cases ought to be decided within 330 days being rendered, um, just paper or are we actually heading somewhere? Yeah, I think uh, you given the numbers, uh, we are definitely flooded. And uh, let me just sort of, uh, uh, I don't want to sound very pessimistic about it, but I think the positive part is that we are flooded because a lot of people want to take recourse to this uh, code, whether it's uh, financial creditors or operational creditors or companies themselves who want to take shelter of Section 10. Uh, so there is, there is a lot of faith in this code. And in fact, the kind of flooding and numbers that we are seeing seems to remind me of uh, the period from 1996 to 2005, six, the first 10 years after the Arbitration and Conciliation Act came about. But I think having said that, I think the weight of numbers is starting to tell. Uh, you know, we are all uh, regularly practicing there. So we know we are appearing in matters and applications which have been filed in 2020, 2019. Uh, the COVID pandemic, of course, didn't help matters. It kind of slowed things down. And despite uh, best efforts of the benches, uh, but, you know, there is only so much that you can do if you're going to hear 40 to 60 or 70 cases a day. In fact, we have benches which are hearing, uh, uh, you know, which are hearing lists from different locations. You know, there is a bench which in the morning hears uh, Chandigarh, then in the post lunch session hears cases from Allahabad or Calcutta. So, so all of that is happening. But uh, I think uh, we are due for an amendment or a series of amendments. In fact, the government has been quite quick. There have been series of amendments. And I think uh, more such amendments are on the way. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a lot of faith, there is a lot of optimism, but the time factor is starting to uh, trouble people. That is a fact. And I, I think we will need to see some proactive amendments because uh, there, like I said, there is no other way to uh, dispose of 60 or 70 cases in a day as in accordance with the timelines that are prescribed under the code. As, and I point noted, so I think the government has been very proactive or rather say quickly responsive to amend the act. And I think this is probably one act that has been in quick succession amended from time to time. Um, so I'd like to take this to you. Um, in your experience, has the IBC achieved its objective fully? Effective resolution of insolvency of the corporate debtor and its revival is a going concern. And, and so one important aspect is prohibiting extra motors uh, in, in terms of Section 29A from coming in. Um, has that been beneficial or has that further delayed the process? Hi. Um uh, quite mixed question in this particular thing. I've got my very personal views uh, regarding the second part. Coming to the first part, uh, I believe that IBC has definitely uh, met the objectives for which it has been brought in. 
the speed at which things have changed compared to prior to IBC where we had different tribunals and the restructuring was on a different tribunal as well as company court was different and quite impossible for any particular uh, company or promoters or banks to resolve its issues under one panel. And the whole objective being that consolidate the loss, uh, maximization of the value and bring the CRP process, take the company out of the uh, existing promoters and shareholders and see that the company grows and the workers and everybody including the bankers move with that. Keeping that in mind, uh, IBC has definitely achieved uh, its goal in substantial way. Yes, it would take a little more time uh, as things would move. It's been flooded with cases now. We need more trained, like my friend uh, was saying, we need more trained people. We need more bandwidth. But fundamentally, the change what I could see uh, predominantly in the whole country as one is uh, there's a complete attitude change between the debtors and the creditors. Today, if you get a notice, People are very serious to understand that you're not going to ignore a legitimate claim that is being made irrespective of the size of the vendor or the amount that is involved. Because even the biggest company can be pulled down very quickly in the span of two, three months if they take it casually. So fundamentally, what I like the most, what has been brought in is the uh, mindset change in the whole economy, uh, public sectors, private sectors corporate construction or any other issue. So therefore, for me, it's a very nice change. Yes, it may take another two, three years more to reach its desired goal. Coming to the second part of it of uh, 29A, I slightly have a different view about it because I strongly feel 29A was more of a moralistic kind of a uh, uh, restriction put on the promoters, stopping them from uh, you know bidding for it. I have my doubts with the, uh, keeping them out. Actually, I love the bankers and the lenders to get actual value what they could have got otherwise uh, if they would have kept them in. And this being a quite an open kind of a system where uh, bids were submitted, so a better bidder who could give a more value to the asset should have actually matched it to the bankers rather than who's giving it. Keeping in view the latest RBI circular that came on 9th June 2023, where the central bank issued a circular saying that uh, OTS and compromise with willful defaulters, fraud declaration accounts and all can be done. They gave a go by in a very right manner that it doesn't matter even if you're a willful defaulter, the OTS looks good, we're going to take it. That actually dilutes the whole 29A and the purpose for which it's been brought in. Rightly so, I welcome uh, government change at uh, state of mind. Thank you. Thank you for that, sir. Priyanka, my next question is to you. You know, we've seen a fair bit of back and forth till, of course, the Supreme Court judgment in Gansham Mishra versus Edelweiss, which if I remember correctly, was somewhere mid to early uh, 2020, that what basically Ghansham Mishra said is that uh, any tax liability which is not a submitted at the time of calling for um, uh, uh, claims and to not f uh, counted for in the resolution plan stands extinguished. It's a clean state uh, slate, you start afresh. But do you think that's the only tax issue that is sort of was a deterrent initially or do you think that there are more issues that sort of need to be addressed to make the whole insolvency process slightly more robust? Yeah, so this uh, judgment actually surprisingly has been very famous but me being a tax professional, it's actually not even half of the tax issues which we are end up facing while filing the resolution plan. Uh, so this judgment actually only talks about the crystallized liabilities. But what about the ones which are uncrystallized? There are number of years which are going to be not assessed or not crystallized and the liabilities can be immense, you know, in future. So while in the resolution plan, we end up praying for, you know, all the crystallized, uncrystallized, all sort of liabilities get extinguished. But the fact is the tax officer continues to harass the companies. We have seen practically that corporate debtor is struggling, their bank accounts get freeze for, you know, non-payment of taxes, etc. Uh, besides that, uh, you know, we've come across seven years of IBC. The first amendment for tax laws came in 2018, uh, which was only pertaining to the carry forward of tax losses available. Uh, now, what about the write back of liabilities? Now, from a purely from a tax perspective, there's no clear law under the tax laws which says that, look, if you're writing back a liability, you go ahead and not pay any taxes. Uh, from a judicial precedent standpoint, typically these kind of write backs are, you know, categorized into two categories. Uh, one being a capital nature loan and second being a revenue nature loan. Now, if it's a capital nature loan, 
you end up writing it back etc and since you've never claimed an expense against it in the past you don't pay taxes on that and that's what the precedents also say uh, but what about the revenue nature loan uh, if you do have a revenue nature loan and you end up writing that back it hits your pnl now if it's your peer pnl uh, tax officer say look uh while you are a bankrupt company you come and pay tax against it because we are adding it back in your pnl uh, so you know structuring these transactions becomes extremely important because tax laws have never been clear around this and uh, you know funny question is from all my clients that look we are bankrupt and the tax officer is asking us to pay taxes i mean that that's you know this this kind of amendment and this kind of uh, you know push by the government is a must right now uh because we've come across 7 years in the ibc and till now we don't have any clarity around tax issues uh the second most important thing uh, besides the write back is there are certain valuation rules which are gov- given under the income tax laws so you have to acquire those shares of a company at a minimum of that valuation if you don't do that the tax officer will assign a deeming value in the hands of the person who's acquiring it uh and would want to tax you so let's say if uh, there is an asset worth 500 crores and you actually end up acquiring it at let's say 200 crores tax officer will say come and pay taxes on 300 crores which is uh, not the intent the real liquidation value of a company must be seen whereas tax laws and the liquidation valuation doesn't align with each other tax laws just take into account the stamp value of a property let's say or the nav of the company which is effectively the net asset value of the company uh so yeah i think i think we we really are far from uh far behind in terms of ibc more from a tax perspective and definitely there are clarities which are required uh one piece of advice for everyone is just please structure your transaction and please ensure we are praying for appropriate resolutions in the resolution plan itself and it's approved by nclt so that we have a strong ground uh you know at the time of litigating these issues and actually Uh, you know building your case stronger around this you know i'll add a little anecdote here when we were preparing the defense of accused in the 2g trial one of them turned around and said we were trying to understand a transaction from him and i said well, it doesn't make sense he's like that's the problem every problem starts because you're trying to structure a transaction from tax purposes <laughs> so yeah <it's>, yeah <laughs> uh, because tax is a real issue Correct. we've seen bank accounts getting attacked which is actually mm, a big problem in today's correct. world yes. so you, if you want the company to function how are you supposed correct. to function if the tax officer will end up uh, on that note i'm that. going to take this to pooja pooja when in uh, 2016 the um, insolvency code was sort of going through you know where is debates in parliament and getting passed i remember the then finance minister mr jaitley making a very profound statement saying that this code is going to galvanize a new era of entrepreneurship in the country uh from that context and i know you're an active practitioner on the insolvency code side in the last 7 years have you seen that you know acquisition of distressed companies has sort of actually brought about challenges and opportunities for entrepreneurs for promoters thanks naya very very good evening to everyone uh you know the way our code actually functions today i would say more than anything it's actually structured as an mna of distressed company and the reason for that uh, actually is section 29a uh because if initially when the code came about the idea was for promoters to actually restructure their companies to put in resolution plans to revive their companies that was also meant to encourage entrepreneurship because if a company is failing uh, the entrepreneurs can shut them down and then move on with their lives um strangely enough we had the section 29a come in in 2017 and after that uh, effectively instead of being a resolution that promoters are proposing for their own companies it has actually become an mna process for distressed companies um coming to some statistics you know today um, uh, i was reading a very interesting statistic which was that around 600 more than 600 resolution plans have been approved so far and in most of those cases the plans have been put up by non promoters because most of the promoters would be uh, debarred under section 29a so we are talking about roughly 500 companies being acquired in the span of last 5 years so 
leaving aside the question of entrepreneurship where promoters themselves are trying to revive the company as far as m and a is concerned it has been a fantastic journey journey for the m and a process we have seen some very very large groups you know like so tatas and jsws and arcelor mittal acquiring multiple companies one after the other and and in effect they have actually managed to consolidate a lot of their positions through this m and a process when it comes to opportunities um i think the biggest opportunity here is the fact that you don't really need shareholder consent to acquire a company uh, through nclt process so any other regular m and a process would require a shareholder consent of the target would require the board consent of the target but i think ibc is one of the few laws where you can actually take over a company and you don't even need shareholder consent you can just do it under the process the other opportunity is of course the clean slate principle um i'm not get, getting into how it has gotten diluted and what the challenges are but more or less the resolution applicant does get the company on a clean slate basis and that is very very attractive for any acquirer of a company um so i think these are two major factors that have really brought about um such a massive mma activity through the code some of the challenges which i would highlight i think from a resolution applicant's perspective there are three major challenges one is the quality of information and the type of due diligence which is being done on these companies we have a very short period of time uh, as a resolution applicant you get barely one or two months to actually do a diligence on the company and then make your resolution plan um the quality of information is not very good because most of the time the promoters are not cooperating so you do not have that kind of information to make an assessment about the company so that's number one the second is a uh, lack of legal, legal certainty we have uh, you know one judgment which may come out about how secured creditors are to be treated the very next day you have another judgment about how tax is to be treated as secured uh, creditor you have various issues surrounding pf and gratuity and who needs to pay all of these all of this is falls within the realm of legal uncertainty good or bad i think it's very important for legislature to make the law very clear as to what are going to be what are the liabilities that will be taken over by the resolution applicant and i think the last one the biggest challenge that we see is of course the timeline um and again i'm just just uh, reading some statistics the shortest time in which a resolution plan has been approved by the nclt is a total of 331 days from the start of the process and the longest has been 2114 days which is more than 5 years so we are talking about cases where a resolution applicant may have put in a bid but is then made to wait for years more than 2 years 3 years and by that time the entire company may have changed so i think that is that i think is one of the biggest challenge that we have with the mna process thank you uh pooja for that that's that's really interesting insight uh mr kapoor uh, uh, sorry, sorry mr kumar this one's for you um would you say that the unfettered powers powers conferred on the coc in determining who can acquire the corporate debtor is a boon or a bane to the economy thanks uh, it's a really you know uh, already uh, uh, my speakers have already covered uh, you know a lot of things on this particular aspect uh, uh, it's, it's arvin ji as well as the vikram ji see the when i see the introspect of this uh, ibc act for last 7 years i i i find that you know this act has you know uh, brought for certain certain purposes now it's going to you know a uh, little more uh, left and right the role of the coc is 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 was a very crucial from the very beginning and now still it's 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 continuing uh, uh, de de developing its its own uh, area of operations the recent amendment has brought it you know the uh, on on september 16 september so one one amendment of uh, has brought uh, saying that you know okay, the role must be you know the it must be a stakeholder consultations uh, committee instead of the credit credit committee but still see the uh, the coc uh, if you look at you know the uh, genesis if you look at you know the D debt recovery tribunals uh, drt act surface act see the 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 creditors have a have a have a very uh, large stake stake into this particular aspects uh, of of uh, resolutions or you know the 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 insolvency from the very beginning in the loan document if you will look at i i i from the uh, banking banking side so you will see that you know ki the always uh, the creditors have a lot of stake into the their the the their loan stakes and all so they have a more and more interest on 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 these all aspects 
so why i believe you know the creditors have a more uh, importance yes, more role to play and and more and more if you look at uh, they have to take a lot of haircut you take it any 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 big entities uh, of the of the you know the uh, insolvency you will find that the haircut is being taken by the banks and all correct see the role function if you will look at they are not supreme uh, very recent amendment if you will look at you know the financial institutions uh, uh, you know liquidations process if you look at ilfs the uh, 19 they have made an amendment and they said you know coc has to take approval from the regulator Correct. also so in this in this case and the any any financial institutions or or uh, uh, entity uh, the regulator is rbi so, and rbi has to give the uh, clearance uh, clearance so for uh, that, for their for their resolutions Correct, let it be sri let it be ilfs let it be you know the uh, uh, dhfl even yes bank also you know you will you will find that the credit committee has a, a diff, different angle and more and more rbi has also been given power to Absolutely. appoint administrator so on that note i'm going to take this to pallavi pratap yeah pallavi in the last two years one has seen that while there is this whole um, angle going on in nclt with all the delays of late there is a trend where there are complaints against the rp not just with the ibbi but also actually complaints under the prevention of corruption act that leads us to a very picking situation to try and understand is the rp even a public servant under the meaning of the pc act and should there be such complaints because all of this only frustrates and derails the process a little more what are your what are your views on that i can see that the time is running <laughs> so i'm going to very quickly answer it but i think first to actually add to what mr nayar said in the initial thing you know we should actually thank god that uh, the threshold was actually increased from 1 lakh to 1 crore so we have a lot of those frivolous litigation actually out one secondly i think uh, ibc is increasingly being used as a recovery mode so it's a it's more of a drt now than uh, what it was initially thought of and to answer your question i think uh, a lot of us who have been practicing and mr nayar would actually um, i'm sure uh, agree with me that uh, there are too many there are too many complaints against the rps there are um, claims which they are not accepting a lot of times they are doing their adjudicatory work which they are not required to do which is completely out of the role that they that has been defined and also with respect to um, uh, the specific question of whether or not they can be covered under prevention of corruption act they are in some senses actually doing a public duty and because they are performing that public duty they may be covered under that specific terminology of section 21 however having said that i think there are too many writs which are pending before the high court and now supreme the court. supreme court has in the vacation bench taken over that cognizance that okay i'm going to find out exactly what we have to do about these resolution professionals so i think that should uh, set the tone right absolutely thank you for that Mr. Nair, I'm back to you. <laughs> so, uh, very quickly, uh, uh, in continuation of what Pallavi said, uh, let's not uh, uh, let's be very clear that the RPs as a class are primarily doing exemplary work. It, it's not an easy job for them, but there are some very serious issues. I, I I'm going to give examples. So you almost it seems you almost read my mind. My next question to you was a follow-on question to what Pallavi had said. So I'm going to give you actual examples very quickly, conscious of the time, and these are actual matters which we have seen. Now, the force of uh, judgment says that the RP's role primarily is a verification role for claims or issues or other uh, stuff that arises with companies which are under reconstruction. But what they are doing increasingly is adjudication. I'm going to just give you those examples. There was a case where there was an arbitration award. a section 34 challenge to that award failed for properties for title of properties despite that the rp goes and includes those properties in the information memorandum and i'm going to use something since you do a lot of criminal work uh, it's often said in criminal law that often the process is the punishment i think some rps who are not really adhering to the code are probably taking shelter that this is now a long process the benches are flooded so we can do as we please because it's going to take 3 years or 5 years before any adjudication takes place this was one example second example was where the debts recovery tribunal in a private dispute between claimants held that the guarantees were rightly invoked the rp says i will not allow the claim because according to me the guarantees have not been rightly invoked this is despite a judgment from the drt so we are increasingly seeing those kind of cases 
I've also appeared uh, on a couple of occasions where I was defending RPs of contempt charges, but I, I don't want to dwell on that because those are matters which are still pending. So I think we'll, we'll have to have some sort of uh, corrective Wait. mechanism put very quickly in place. Otherwise, this will become a major bottleneck. Correct. So that, that actually was my question to you, like, how can this be tackled? But you've answered that with other question being asked. So thank you for that. Uh, so to you. Um, so we're yet to see really a complete play on how the IBC provisions with respect to personal insolvency are going to play out. There is a challenge pending in the Supreme Court, which is round two of the challenge. Uh, but dehors that, I would like to ask you, do you think the personal insolvency provisions in the IBC are slightly harsh as they stand today? Yeah, uh, to the extent of the uh, matter which is pending in Supreme Court, maybe that's more on the technicalities. The first matter, the religion judgment has actually sealed the whole uh, fate of personal guarantees. I personally feel that uh, am among, among all the you know stakeholders of IBC, Personal guarantors are the ones who have been uh, had a very unfair uh, treatment meted out for them because they get nothing in this whole bargain. Neither they are the borrowers, nor they are the ones who are going to run the company, nor they are the ones anyway connected with the company. But they are going to end up, uh, you know, putting everything what they want, including their homes, uh, for sale. So therefore, uh, personal guarantees. I, I submitted a paper before sub, uh, committee of subordinate legislation requesting uh, them to implement it in a prospective manner rather than taking it in a retrospective manner. I personally feel uh, this provision of IBC was a little more, uh, you know, far-fetched and superimposed on Indian context. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Priyanka, my next question is to you. Um, this is actually in continuation of what you said earlier, that there is a need to structure the transactions, uh, more particularly when it's under the CIRP. What, according to you, should be the form of the structure or more particularly what kind of an amendment is required so that the structuring process is sort of, you know, the taxation provisions are in tandem with the IBC for that purpose? Yeah. So, so no, there's there's no one fit, uh, you know, one one fit sort of structure. It really depends on what the transaction is. But uh, just to give an example, a lot of companies do follow um, an SPV structure where they'll actually invest through an SPV. So if you are eventually looking at merging that SPV, do that in the resolution plan. Don't wait for later because it's easier to get the approval alongside. Otherwise, there are other, you know, tax and regulatory issues which may come across, you know, the SPV may be treated as an NBFC entity as well. Um, besides that, we've also seen a lot of times, uh, you know, the debt being structured as, uh, as a, let's say, a hybrid instrument like an OCRPS or an RPS, etc. Uh, so that in future, that debt, whenever it has to be repaid, let's say, to a financial creditor, so not all payments can be cash, right? They can also be uh, amended in the form of a OCRPS, which is given in future. So all of those needs to be kept in mind as well. Uh, and while choosing the instrument, one needs to be mindful of what can, you know, one is, of course, the tax implications. And second is what can be done and what cannot be. So if you continue to have a debt instrument, you can repay that uh, without having uh, profits in the company. Whereas if it's an OCRPS, you can actually redeem it only when the company start making profits. And that happens only when the past losses gets wiped off. Uh, so you need to have those accumulated profits to be able to, I think, I think the short uh, story here is that we are, we need to be mindful of having the right structure and the right instrument in place. And uh, one definitely needs to include everything in the resolution plan at the time of bidding and not wait for the actual approval. Thank to come you in. for that, Priyanka. Pooja, I have a question for you, which is, do you think some, res some reforms would be required to sort of encourage more participation by resolution applicants in the CIRP process? I mean, there are 1,001 reforms, but being cognizant of the time, I'll only name two right now. I think one is the pre-pack and the need to simplify pre-packs and extend it to uh, non-MSMEs. I think that's one thing that can be done. And we understand that that's something which is being actively considered. So that's one set of reforms around pre-packs um, that we would uh, recommend. The other set of reforms would be around bringing certainty on the distribution. And even though resolution applicant may have nothing to do with the distribution process itself, a lot of litigations in the NCLT are around distribution. They are around who gets paid what, secured creditors versus unsecured creditors, tax versus other. So I think it will greatly help the MNA process as well if we have some certainty around how exactly people need to be paid 
and what should be the distribution waterfall that needs to be ready for it in a plant from a plant perspective thank you for that pallavi my next question is really for you so over the years and especially in the last i think last more three four years uh, we've been seeing a a set of conflict that's arising ibc vis-a-vis -vis, say first initially started with the limitation act then you go down the income tax act then it's the pmla then it's the uh, sarfezi so on and so forth um do you think that yes there was an amendment when it came for the limitation act section 230a was brought in but do you think there need it's time now that the entire issue is pending before the supreme court but should there proactively be some amendment to just streamline things because consequently there is there are delays on this account which are also coming into the whole resolution process so you know i'll actually just get back to what vikram said about uh, section 95 the personal insolvency i'm the nodal counsel in that matter so therefore um, uh, it's not merely actually the technicality but also the fact that it is completely against section 100 is completely against the principle of natural justice and that in itself is in contradiction with what is given to us by the fundamental rights in the constitution similarly i think with the latest report that came of the ibc report there um, we were all very hopeful that maybe you know personal insolvency and that principle of natural justice might come in or that there may be dilution in terms of other laws so that maybe ibc as the supreme court is completely gung ho about making sure that ibc provisions are upheld um i think those dilutions would have only come through legislation in that sense but none of that seems to be happening like pmla for instance you do so much white collar crime you would uh, see how section 71 and the 238 has that conflict in it similarly limitation even though there has been a little bit of dilution i think the simple fact that an appeal has to be filed within 45 days itself as at some stage causes trouble for someone who might have not quite possibly not been aware of the fact that there is a pet petition which has been filed in nclat so you know those things i think are there and there are these issues that require to be ironed out but i won't take too much of your yes. time sorry mr kumar to you finally uh, what would be uh, i request you for your closing comments on or thoughts on how does one move forward where the road from now to try and ease and if make this insolvency process as effective as possible what do you think is one or two key amendments required see if i'll summarize already sir has said you know lot of amendment is required tax uh, you know tax regime uh, clearance is required msme msme resolutions and all uh, uh, msme packs and all pre pack is is required so if these all things will be taken care of that and then the uh, way forward of uh, the ibc will be a very good supreme court is intervening uh, from time to time and all so it will be having a good kind of things have taken all the panelist uh, suggestions and all thank you i do uh, we may have just time for one question if at all uh, or we can always take that offline we'll just take it offline it's probably better time is actually uh, thank you thank you all for being such a great audience thank you dan